if you just do it, it'll hey. turn out okay. Hey, everyone. Day night night here. Talking time with caffeine. I figured t today would be a gr great opportunity to talk with someone who wrote a book about the subject. Oh, yes. It's right behind my shoulder there. Mm. Uh, Evolution Slam Dunk. <laughs> like somewhere on that shelf there. Yeah. Oh. All about the therapsids, a.k.a. synapsids, words that everybody is going to go, what? <laughs> and that's why well, I, uh, uh, when, yeah, go ahead. Do, so, do, so, do I, the intros. I, I, I got to say, before we get to that, though, I, I figured we could, uh, since we, I did the, a similar, not, not something, but a, a subject with uh, Walker about our the about the about the uh sar sarcoptrii sar sar yeah to to tetrapod yeah. to, to yeah. listen so I figured we start I said I figured before we get the synapses we go we, we left off and start talking about the three four to four synapses. Uh, oh, wow, yeah, because, uh, well, the synapsids actually are starting to come in during the Carboniferous, which I think is just after the Devonian when the early tetrapods are occurring. And so what yeah. you got, you basically got the origin of amphibians uh, before you get to the reptiles. And the amphibians have the living on land thing down, but they're still very much uh, mating in water and watery eggs and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. the great innovation which I'm not a super expert on. You should probably try to pin down somebody who can fill in that little thing. The origin of the amniotic hard-shelled egg. That's the that's one of the great innovations that land animals developed to where now they weren't restricted to living by water. They could boink yeah. and reproduce just about anywhere. And they did exactly that. Yeah. From what I remember... The first, the first three stages. First is the tetrapods, four limbs, which we have. Yeah, we have four, we have four limbs. I, I think I think we all have four limbs. Do you have four limbs? I th the last time I looked, yes. Uh, then I think it was next one was reptilomorph. Was it called? Yeah. The reason why those come in is because, and I, I pointed this out in uh, uh, Evolution Slam Dunk. Technically speaking, reptiles, which means your nice basic lizards and your squamate snakes and your crocodiles and, and your, your uh, um, um, birds, Gila, Gila monsters, anything that you felt like in this area. Um, these are all groups that are actually occurring later than the synapsids are in the diversion thing. So what we've got is that class reptilia um, refers to just that bunch. And so even though the synapsids are called the reptile like mammals, um, they always, you almost want to put like quotation marks around that. Even though uh, I brought my show and tell of the probably the most instantly memorable Dimetrodon, which almost oh, yeah. everybody has seen from dinosaur kid sets. And that's a synapsid reptile, which will go into all the fiddly bit details on that. But yeah. um, they look reptile-y to start with. And so we then go back to what exactly is the characteristics of that? Um, they still have relatively splayed posture. Uh, they're uh, uh, land vertebrates. They have kind of gotten rid of the multiple digits that the early tetrapods had. Six, seven, yeah. eight really is clumsy for a land animal. And they get stuck in a pentadactyl mode, which almost all vertebrates have stuck with, with minor modifications over time, usually, well, not usually, always involving loss of digits, which you find particularly so in dinosaurs and that bunch, they drop digits like nobody's business, whereas the mammals uh, tend to be relatively uh, straightforward on that. Uh, so uh, bearing in mind that when I say reptile mammal transition, um, I'm, I'm not using that in that precise systematic way that I'm looking at it, that even Robert Prothero, uh, which if you don't, 
it, while you're buying my book, also buy Robert Prothero's wonderful books on fossils. They're absolutely magnificent, beautifully illustrated. Um, uh, Jackson uh, has drawn on that one as well because that's his field. He's a mammal paleontologist and he goes into a ton of material and wonderful things that is critical of, of creationism. They go and explain why the fossils are what they are. Even he says that, you know, if you had one of these critters next to you and a, and a standard run of the mill reptile, uh, it'd be hard to tell them apart <laughs> and you'd have to look closely at the yeah. structure of what's going on in the jaws and detail limbs yeah. and suture patterns. Well, at, at that, at that time we had just, we, we had in geology, geology, we had only recently split up, split from our cousins then. Uh, well, at, at the, um, here we'll get into the, the, we'll define more about what the synapsids means, but in many respects, the synapsids are the first big kids off the block when it comes to dominating the landscape that way. So the reptile group, which we will be more precisely the diapsids, um, uh, they are um, the ones that are emerging later on and eventually become very dominant, but they weren't to start out with. So let's start right yeah. at the basics. Oh, which I, mm. I, fast, I, I made a joke about that one time. Like after the amniotes split up into mm -hmm. the diapsids and the synapsids, give or take, or whatever they were called yeah. for the diapsids, like like it was like a civil war. In the Permian, the synap the synapsid side ruled. And then all of a sudden, the, the diapsids won the war for a few. For a few for yeah, a few I don't years. I don't like to quite use the the warfare analogy. What I, I know, it was, was a joke. That and then then we took back we got we got back after after the the asteroid hit. Yeah, we we, we wanted to, probably we, should we, for everybody that um, is coming into this kind of cold. And by the way, almost every creationist you bump into will have problems with map of time issues. So it's always good to have a clear sense of this in your own framework. I will pray down your nice big Mesozoic period, 150 million years. You got Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. Pretty much those are buzzwords which a lot of people will know, although we all we bumped into creationists. <laughs> you bumped into a, a, a creationist and others that, that don't really understand those terms. But that big block of 150 million years, uh, the, the middle period, meso means middle, the middle age, uh, like middle earth, was the time that separated from the really early stuff that was like trilobites and all that. And then the modern period, which is the age of mammals. That was the kind of the, the frame that I was growing up with. Well, almost all of the mammal stuff that on origins of mammals is before the Mesozoic. By the time we get down to the late Triassic, when the first dinosaurs are appearing, um, the early mammals are on the scene. And so we have to look at what had happened earlier. The Permian period, which had the big mass extinction at 250, uh, and that spread into the Triassic, and that was the marking of the new Mesozoic Age. That was the the, the, the great heyday of uh, the, the therapsids and synapsids. And they had, in fact, been dominating the show. It wasn't as though there weren't any reptiles around. The reptilia were starting to emerge around the same later on, but during the time when the synapsids were, were controlling things so yeah. well. Uh, and it's, it, it's, hard to get an, it's hard to get a leg up in a new niche. There's part of the issues that you go. If you're the yeah. earliest kids on the block, newcomers have trouble invading your niches. And yeah. so for a, a long time, the... the the, the uh, synapsids were so diverse and successful that everybody else was kind of scampering in the corner until uh, a mass extinction upsets our, everybody's our, apple cart. A good old friend extinction. Yeah, yeah. And and don't remember, don't forget that in that Permian mass extinction, this is in the tail end of the story that we're going to be telling. Uh, only one little order of therapsids squeaked through the the Permian this, mass extinction. This, the cyanodonts. Uh, the Ly Lystrosaurus, I think, uh, uh, when the pigs was, ruled the earth, there was an old sh uh, show on there. But yeah, the, the synodons, in fact, I think are even a little bit later in the, the Triassic period. There's, there's Were they the, the, the synodons? Uh, well, there's, there's a whole bunch of terminology there that can just bog you down because there's so many. The dot part, by the way, refers to teeth. And yeah. that's telling you something really important about what's going on in those uh, synodonts and that uh, that makes it so distinctive. And there's a reason why um, uh, the, the synapsids are are uh, doing okay. things that yeah. you're not seeing happening over in the reptile side. Yeah, but okay, we're, we're, get, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. That's way yeah. in the future. It's easy to do. Yeah, so, so what makes us synapsids? Okay, 
Uh, it's that we have one skull hole in our skull. Now, if you look at the typical uh, dinosaur, you're going to see a bunch of openings, one for the nose, the nares, and there's another for the orbit, for the eyeball. But there's also skull openings behind, and those are muscle attachments. And the arc, uh, dinosaurs, archosaurs, and others are characteristic diapsid two, two skull openings. So on the skull, it's as if you've got, boy, it's hard to turn around here in such a way that I mean, um, uh, that yeah, I'm on this side. Okay. There'd be a hole here and a hole here, well back on the skull. Uh, the original uh, organisms didn't have muscle attachment holes. They just, the muscles were just attaching directly onto the bone. And what these skull openings allow is for a little bit more grabbiness around the edge to act as more of a lever. And it's no coincidence that the diapsids with their two skull opening muscle attachments uh, had kind of extra snappy jaws. And that probably gave them an advantage as time wore on. But they weren't on the scene initially. What was on the scene were the single opening synapsids. They should call it monapsid or something that would have been better sense. But, you know, that damn Greek and Latin crap that everybody was fiddling off of. So they got stuck with it. S-Y-N synapsid. Uh, and what that single skull opening eventually turns into, when we look at a skull, a Halloween skull, we don't see something back in the skull because everything is morphed around. That skull opening has shifted forward and it is what we call the zygomatic arch. This part right here in our cheekbone, that's the old synapsid thing morphed around to be kind of flat and the jaw structure has come up into it. So that's a little bit of the basic anatomy. And, and one thing that makes them so distinctive that's why if you go into a museum and you know the difference between um, a mammal form and a uh, um, diapsid, you can spot it. You'd go for that damn zygomatic arch. If it's got one of those little openings that come across like that, you go, uh oh, that's a mammal. <laughs> then the other thing is the damn teeth. And that's we'll, we'll be getting into that in the course of the storyline. <laughs> so after uh, the synapsids, what was our, what was our, next big thing what was our... well the the whole issue involves uh, uh, and i won't go into all the, the the grisly terminology because it's better to remember what's happening rather than to remember which name refers to what because uh, there, there's a they true. covered 100 million years it's a bewildering elaborate thing and uh -huh. and uh, since a lot of them look a lot alike um, it's not as easy as you are with dinosaurs where you go, oh, yeah. there's a triceratops and there's a stegosaur where they've got so many little surface details that make them very easy. Most of your, of your synapsids minus the frill, uh, yeah. look a lot like this for a very long time until they look a little less like that until they realize that they've got fur and they're yeah. now in early mammal status. So, okay. So, so the but, thing, sorry. yeah, I guess I was going to uh, ask you. Yeah. So after after the synapses, is this where we split? Is this where we split off from the the, the, the metrodons at this point, or further oh, down? Oh, uh, well, they're they're in a, they're in an early group of they were both uh, predators and herbivores, and there's actually a a huge number of lineages. In their own way, the synapsids are just as diverse as the dinosaurs were. They they don't get as big. Uh, the Dimetrodon's about oh 12 feet long, something like that, and that's you know it's it's a uh, uh, and that's including the tail. Uh, they're not ridiculously large by dinosaur standards. And when I was a kid growing up, I was I was kind of poo pooing those little synapsids because they just look like reptiles. They're not nearly as yeah. neat as my dinosaurs. I, I know. I had I used to have, I used to have a, I had a book about dinosaurs, and unfortunately, I know the time I do now, but. They had, I think they had the metrodons within that group of dinosaur book. Oh, they're, they're routinely put in dinosaur kits because they're prehistoric beasts. Uh, and a lot of them, my particular case, because I'm an old fart, so I'm growing up in the 1960s. And there was a dinosaur set, and I still have them. And you still see the molds that are used for them for relatively cheap kids' dinosaur sets today because they're not on the same scale. But they're based on the Yale University mural. A uh, pageant of life or something like that that was done, I don't know, 1930s or so. And and almost all of the designs that they used for these were drawn lock, stock, and barrel, including the color. So there was a white tyrannosaur and a brown brontosaurus, and there was a dimetrodon, and there was a sphenacodon, and moss chops, and these various critters. They're all in that bloody mural. And so they were basically making little kids' models of them but they weren't to scale. And I knew they weren't dinosaurs and they looked kind of normal reptile-y. They weren't up on their hind legs and doing neat things. 
uh, or gigantic like the way brontosaurs were. Uh, so all the critters that we're seeing, they diversify, but they diversify in a subtle way. And, and it's all about the bloody head because unlike um, the dinosaurs where there's so much variation in the number of neck vertebrae and these side frills and spikes and all that, apart from the occasional fin back, um, most of them are trimmed down critters with about the same back anatomy, uh, the same pelvic structure. There's very little modification to that. Where the thing changes is in the head and it involves the jaw and what happens with the jaw and the teeth. Because here's where we get to the slam dunk of why the reptile mammal transition is so cool and why I didn't need to put a PowerPoint. Because I li we literally carry the evidence around in us. Your standard vertebrate jaw has a dentary bone right up in the front. And then there's a bunch of other bones behind it. And the one in the back is the articular bone, which articulates, duh, with the uh, quadrate bone up in the skull. That's the standard layout, fish and amphibians and uh, all the reptiles and all the dinosaurs, all of that stuff, same monotonous, boring, duh, except us. Mammals uniquely don't have that arrangement. And it was figuring out how that happened is what the whole reptile mammal transition is about. Because what we start seeing, uh, these fossils also, and let me give a little time frame, not only for the period of what we're talking about, Carboniferous, which is like, uh, oh, uh, yipes, 300 million years ago or more, uh, yeah. down into the Permian period, down to 250. That's the big heyday of what we're talking about in this uh, bit. Um, so Quick question real fast. Yeah. Uh, did the did the synapsis split off from the amniotes and the, the whatever the other group was ca called uh, during the Carboniferous still, or was this during the, in the Permian now? Um, well, the, the early synapsids are, are starting to develop in the Carboniferous period, very as late if memory serves me. So most of their big activity of diversifying uh, is occurring later. It's in, by the time the synapsids have come along, a little bit later on, as they're diversifying, that's when you start seeing the first absolute crown reptiles. And again, they remain very, very trivial. They have little niches. Uh, there's probably a good paleoecological reason why they're doing what they're doing and why they're going into other areas. But an interesting bunch that led off in new directions. An awful lot of the group, their Gorgonopsids and others that are in the early synapsid line that eventually just fizzle out, they go extinct. Now, we're talking 100 million years, 50 million years that these things will have run, but nonetheless, they're not the group that eventually led into mammals. The ones that led into mammals are relatively small, way smaller than Demetrodon. These are, are getting now to be mouse-sized critters. But what's really curious about them is what's happening with their jaw. And the jaw, the dentary bone that holds those teeth is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. That diaps, uh, that synapsid skull opening is morphing around more. Oh, I see Ian Chen uh, is in the live chat. I got the live chat. I think, hi, Ian. I've been giving uh, hey. Ian some pointers. He's uh, been uh, considering to having some debates uh, with Standing for Truth and Nephilim Free, and I was giving him some source material. Uh, on that so that he could deal with that stuff. It's it's fun. Anyway, we're, we're, we're in the exciting world of synapses. Um, so that dentary bone is getting bigger and bigger. And something else is kind of interesting is that if you look at a, a standard dinosaur, um, and in fact, reptiles in general, their teeth are pretty much all the same. Whatever kind of teeth they have, they got a bunch of them along that dentary bone. And that dentary bone can get quite large, but it's always got those little extra bones at the end. Whereas what's starting to happen as well with mammals or the synapsid line is there are teeth with varying shapes in the same jaw structure. That's the thing that eventually become all the Demetrodon style teeth are pretty much the same thing, although even they've got a bit of a fang structure for some of the long versions. But eventually this becomes much more dominant. And even though uh, in diapsids, in dinosaurs, you have uh, teeth shapes that can form like leaf forms and there's like cheese grater things that you find in the ceratopsids and the hadrosaurs uh, that uh, make for complex structures. 
mammals are very specialized in having those front canines and then the molars in the back and the molars have complex cusps that allow them to do occlude. And so they can grind up stuff, uh, uh, meat, uh, they're, they're uh, herbivores, they can grind up stuff in very, very, uh, the meat slicing carnassials for uh, um, uh, predator types and all that. That slowly but surely starts developing and eventually develops in the varying lineages that pop down the line. And, and there's in fact a whole subcategory of the various teeth shapes that have occurred in those synapses and into the mammals. And there was an analysis that was done a few years ago. I can't think, Yernval or, or, um, or somebody was starting with a key, a K, I've referenced it in the book. But they have found the genes that govern those little cusps on the teeth. And they've been able to retro engineer different teeth forms based upon flipping around the gene regulations, including extinct ones that are only known in those therapsids that aren't known in any further. So that's that's paleo engineering again. Anyway, so, so what you got, yeah, jump in. I was gonna say, the so, so what makes us therapsids then? That, I think that's the next okay. major. Okay, all, all the terminology is, the synapsid is the, is the single jaw bit, the rhapsids they start using later on in the field that these are the groups that are getting more and more mammalian in structure. Then finally, you've got these synodonts that are a subset of those that are just getting really close to mammalness. And by mammalness, then what are we talking about? We're talking about the jaw structure. We're talking about tooth forms. We're talking about a uh, fur. Uh, we're talking about all the hair and lactation and all that and eventually live birth. Uh, there's a whole bunch of elements that we normally would tag mammal. And as they started to accumulate the data, it was clear that these didn't all happen all at once. But yeah. This was a long term process. I, so, uh, question, their question was the rapsids around the time that we maybe s switched from uh, endothermic to echo, echo, what was that? I can't, yeah, I think that would be a fair thing. Uh, I can't pronounce the, the problem with the term for it. Yeah, endothermy versus ectothermy, warm-blooded versus cold-blooded. Yeah, uh, that's occurring during the therapsids. And it's highly likely that the thermostat is developing. And the same thing is happening over in dinosaurs, by the way, which is actually yeah. now starting to be contemporary when you start getting into the Mesozoic. Um, that um, th there's an issue about just high a thermostat did dinosaurs have and did all of them have the same high thermostat? And remember, birds are warm-blooded and have a higher temperature than mammals. They, their thermostat's a couple degrees higher than ours. It'll, they just burn it like never, um, never mind. Um, so yes, that, that thermal regulatory issue, there's a development of the specialized mammalian four-chamber heart, which again has popped up um, the crocodiles developed a four chambered heart and were doing that, but then kind of lost it as unnecessary when the crocodiles moved into what we now have, which have a relatively limited range. They're not as nearly as diverse as they were during the dinosaur period. Yeah, yeah, so I know. Yeah, off the topic, the egg, I had some crocodiles were on hooves and everywhere else there on land, some land crocodiles and sea, ocean crocodiles. They were all over the yeah. place. Yeah. In uh, in one of the my uh, I think tip 1.4, I went into some information on that. And I, and I think we I allude to it somewhat in um, Evolution Slam Dunk. And I think we bring it up as well in the rocks were there. Uh, the crocodiles are really interesting and it really pisses off crocodile experts when people say, oh, they're like living fossils. No, they're not. Have you any idea how diverse the crocodiliaformes are? No, 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 no. And that's another thing when you mention the mammaliaformes. Um, and you've got reptilia formes, and you've got dinosaur formes, and you've got uh, uh, avia formes, and uh, uh, mammalia formes. In other words, when you're before you see the first definites of anything, there's in the fossil record already the almosts, the nearlies, the boy that's close to's, <laughs> and that's yeah. exactly what you'd expect from. Yeah, Erica talked about that on the last episode. The difference between a primate and a primate, primate morph. Yeah. And uh, um, there again, you're talking about critters that start out uh, about the size of a, of a you, know, you can hold them in your hand, little itty bitty critters. And uh, only later on do we start seeing larger forms and adapting into different environments and shifting by geographically. And there's all that kind of stuff, which is why paleontology is so absolutely delightful and why creationists are so bad at it. 
because there's so much information that they need to deal with. So back to our synapsids and, and this jaw teeth thing okay. is that what's interesting is uh, one of the things that Michael Denton, the anti-evolutionist with the Discovery Institute was uh, bringing up is what was supposedly the adaptive reason why a jaw would shift over to the mammal form. And he just avoided thinking about all the evidence. And part of the thing was, uh, I gotta kind of turn around here and use a kind of little graphic here with my little hand here, uh, that we've got the upper jaw and the lower jaw, right? And they are standard reptile layout to start out with, with all those little extra bones, but the dentary bone has got the teeth in there. And what we see is expansion of the dentary bone with all of its teeth along with it. But not only that, it's what they're eating. And one of the things that apparently played quite a role in the group that eventually leads off into mammals is what they ate. Because it turns out they eat insects, insectivores. Omnivorous, they can probably eat other things than that, but they were definitely bug eaters. And it turns out to be a good bug eater doesn't need a strong jaw. It only needs a long, thin jaw with a bunch of backward-facing teeth in it. And that's what's going on in a lot of these little groups that are dominating so many of these little small niches of critters that are roughly mouse size that are insectivores. Because it means that they don't have to bother about the jaw attachment being strong. They only need to worry about what happens when they bite on a bug. Because what happens is their weak little jaws go... And, boop, 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 and the backward teeth pull the thing back and they go smush, mush, mush. And there you got bug dinner. Yeah. So real, real easy. So definitely not the uh, granop the granopsis jaws. Yeah, yeah. Those monsters, those big, uh, some of them were uh, um, uh, predators because the, the Dimetrodon back in its era was one of the big predators of the time. And other reason probably why um, the diapsids were starting to make their headway is because I, I'm not thinking of a great many notable predators in the therapsid lineage as we move on through time, that they become increasingly herbivorous and they dominate their herbivore niche. And some of them get quite relatively large. They're bigger than the critter that's attacking them. Uh, we're talking about small lizard-sized uh, diapsids. I think that's part of the, the dynamic that's going on. Another thing that's happening in as we move uh, into the Mesozoic with the Triassic is uh, um, the supercontinent has initially formed, which was very arid in the inner area. An awful lot of the um, um, therapsid fossils are known from the Karoo down in South Africa. Uh, uh, North America and all the spots being smushed together. There was a lot of desert and, and bleak, not a hell of a lot living there. Things are living along the coasts. And the, the climate was relatively, it, it was temperate, but also dry and uh, in a lot of spots. And as the place began to break up, it was eventually forming a much uh, uh, more tropical climate globally. And that probably worked against the whole therapsid lineage with their increasingly mammalian metabolism, that you have to maintain that high battery uh, power, uh, whereas your um, reptiles didn't. They just go out and sun in the warm world and go out and eat. So that was another dynamic that was playing a role. Anyway, the yeah. big the big thing... Yeah, you have a question? I, was just, I heard that mammal... as, as uh, as a ma mammals, we have to eat more often than the, the, the diapsid reptiles side does. Yeah. Yeah. Because you, you have that high body temperature to maintain that if you, if you're getting all of your heat from your environment, you sit there like a torpid lizard in the morning and it's cold and then you're warm in the sun. There you go. And now you got enough to be able to move around. You don't have to waste the amount of time to eat enough to maintain the fuel stocks. In the same way that if you have the energy for it, a bicycle is real easy because it doesn't contain any power source. You just start pedaling, but it's dependent on you. And if you can only rev up when you get warm, mm, bees do the same thing. They have to warm themselves up and all that thing. Uh, whereas mammals with their high thermostats and birds with their high thermostats, the extreme case is a hummingbird that functionally has to eat continuously because in order to do what it does, it's burning up energy so bloody fast that it has to constantly refuel. 
And uh, there's, so there's upsides and downsides. You have the advantage. Uh, it's, it's arguable that um, it's difficult to be a flyer if uh, a mammal, a, ver a vertebrate flyer, if you don't have a pretty high thermostat. And we're still uncertain what the uh, pterosaurs were doing, but we know the birds and mammals, uh, the bats, uh, both have uh, high rates of metabolism. And so it's very possible that to be a heavier than air flyer of that type, if you're not a bug, uh, you have to be able to do that. Yeah, kind of thing. stupid, stupid, and stupid protostone insects that they beat us on the land and the air. Yeah, and, and are most of the organisms. Uh, we, we, we get all hoity-toity and we look about, wow, we've got like, like a couple thousand species of mammal. Well, blip. Uh, the reptiles have way more than that, and the and the insects will sit over there and go. Excuse me, we got five hundred thousand species of just beetles. Suck it, you vertebrates! And when you look at the phyla, that that uh, we have a chart in um, uh, the rocks were there, which lists off the various animal phyla, and what immediately jumps out. And I had in fact make a, a double set of charts to file it that way, so you see the basic chart in terms of the chronology, and then you look at it in another variable. Almost all the animal phyla are protostomes. <laughs> There's only like three animal phyla that are deuterostomes like us. And, and it's we're, we're off in the corner. And if you look at the whole total number of species, probably all the most of the body mass of organisms on the planet are the protostomes. So we're just like pimples on the back ass of all of those in, in, and enormously successful because the insects are almost extinction proof. Yeah. Other than the ma other than the Permian mass extinction that gave them a bit of a speed bump, uh, they basically go through mass extinctions. They're going, what? What did something happen? Where did all the dinosaurs go? What? <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course. Then again, as eukaryotes were, were even a smaller group than the, the, the other. Yeah. The anyway, back to our back to our delightful synapses. Uh, um, yeah. The interesting I'll, thing I'll... about this jaw transition is that it's the thing that really turned me into an evolutionist. It's the smoking gun, the slam dunk, the duh bit. Because when they were looking at this in the late 19th century, you have, here's the nature of the problem. Mammals have a gigantic dentary bone and no other bone in our jaw. All of our dentary bone, that's all of our teeth with its complicated things. And it hinges on the squamosal bone up in the skull, not the quadrate, it's a completely different bone. And you go, where the hell is the articular quadrate? Oh, wait a minute. There it is. It's in our ears. We literally know, and this was discovered in the 1830s, that in development, the jaw is laid out in the reptile fashion in our embryos until the dentary bone expands and bumps into the squamosal. And then that little articular quadrate that was still there is pulled up just into the middle ear. So they knew that developmentally. But the question is, how did that happen in the bones? And in the by the 1890s, they were spotting to see those reptile-like mammals with their enlarged dentary bone, their shrinking skull form, and that opening up zygomatic arch. And they go, boy, that's starting to look awfully mammal. Wow. You think this is where the mammals might have come from? Because nothing like this is going on over in the diapsids. They were getting more and more dinosaur bones and all these other ones. They all have that standard reptile layout. But this group, these synapsids alone, were doing that. And that's where Robert Broom enters the picture. Um, he lived down in South Africa. And later on in the 1920s, he became really more famous for dealing with Australopithecines. He was digging up stuff in there. So he's usually associated with human evolution story. But before he was on that gig. He was just a mammal paleontologist down in South Africa. And so he was seeing this stuff coming in. And in 1912, he wrote a little paper where he said, you know, in order to get from a reptile jaw layout to a mammal jaw layout, there's only one way this is going to work. Only one. You're going to have to have a double jaw organism. You're going to have to have one with an articular quadrate and then a second jaw hinge with the dentary squamosal. And by the way, the articular quadrate in these organisms is on the outside, whereas the dentary squamosal connections on the inside of the jaw. Okay. So you could have them, they won't conflict, but they gotta be in the same place. So the, the, the skull has to morph around so that the edge of the dentary bone is right next to where the articular is. 
and the squamosal and the quadrate have warped down so that they're right next to it so the new muscle hinge can form and they all pull the same way so that you don't have a problem. And then okay. eventually that dentary squamosal jaw hinge starts taking over and eventually becomes the only one. That's the model he put out. Now there were no animals like that. No living organism is laid out like that. There is no double jawed organism like that. And no fossils were known for it either. He was predicting that in order for that to happen, there had to have been a transition that is the unique transition from the single jaw to a double jaw to back to a single jaw where it's now the mammal layout. So, la di da, in 1930. Yeah. So, uh, 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 speaking of jaws and stuff, well, when I th I don't know if it's all mammals or just us, but like I, I think reptiles have I don't know if reptiles do or not. Like like mammal I think mammals a reptile I think it's maybe it's just mammals that have a limited number of teeth in their jaw. Oh well, it, it's not merely the number of teeth because some some animals can become toothless. Uh, the dinosaurs eventually went toothless. Okay, uh, some might have just vestigial teeth. But the neat thing about mammals is that they developed, and we can see this in the same thing as while this jaw is shifting, that we see the formation of the mammalian tooth battery, where you have a canine teeth up front, and then you have a, a molar teeth in the back that are highly specialized uh, for plant eating. And now by that time, you're getting into critters that are no longer into insect eating. And it also opens up new niches that they can deal with something else. And because there's something else that that jaw hinge allows us to do. By having the muscles laid out the way we do, we can do this easily. We can shift the jaw to one side in a way that's really difficult for reptiles. And so jaw strength, if you're a predator, you need to have a relatively strong, uh, a strong jaw, but omnivorous, you don't necessarily need a terribly strong jaw, but that maneuverability is really important. And that's a part of the reason why mammals go off in particular directions in eating things. And mammals just proliferate a staggering number of tooth cusps, the little nubs on the top of the teeth. If, if you've ever looked at a, a woolly mammoth skull, you'll see an elephants in any of those groups. The proboscideans have these monstrous batteries of teeth and they're all these little ribbles and wriggles because what happens is you want the tooth on the top to match up and nesh to make a grinding surface with the thing down below. That's the occlusion issue. And so you get a, a selection pressure for those teeth matching like that. You don't have to worry about that if you're a tyrannosaur, it's a, 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 a rip and gulp uh, thing. You rip the stuff off and that's as far as you go. But if you have to eat plants or specialized food, uh, bone breaking, for example, hyenas uh, have to have enormously strong jaws, tyrannosaurs and others. If you have things where you have to break through bone, uh, that's a different kettle of fish. And that doesn't involve tooth shape. Tooth shape, uh, serrated teeth, that shows up whether or not you're carnivores or not. You've got sh teeth that are particularly backward curved teeth indicate that it eats fish because that's really handy if you're trying to snip onto something that can slip away from you in the water. So all of these things are are the dynamics of tooth diagnostics. But do we know if, I, I know we don't, when we got, we were, when we, the mammals came around, we were still egg laying at the time, but do we know if in, in the past, if they were like leathery eggs or solid or hard eggs? They probably would have been not unlike what happens with monotremes. And I don't think monotreme has a super hard shelled egg. Remember that, that with our own mammals, we've got the egg laying monotremes of which there's only two groups left, uh, the echidnas and the platypuses, uh, but they would have been the standard model. All of those monotremes would have been the earliest of the mammals. Then, they de then an offshoot eventually develops the marsupial mode which figures out how to give live birth and then development a little bit afterwards. So you're, you're now finishing up a lot of the development out of the birthing process. And then the full-blown placental mammals that keep you in that little placental bag until you're all done and then spit you out as functionally an organism that maybe has to go through a little bit of growth, but basically can do what it does right off the bat. Except for, and, except for us. Except for us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, which is quite another little kettle of fish. And so that that uh, uh, 
probably the most difficult thing, especially for creationists to wrap their heads around, is that all of these layers of things that we call mammal aren't all happening in one big lump, that they're occurring in stages and sometimes even convergently. So this jaw shifting thing was going on in several lineages because there was presumably a selection pressure for uh, that particular jaw shape and it was occurring in multiple lineages, not just the one. You mean that we didn't all happen in, in, in the fifth and sixth days? Yeah, it, yeah. Again. And remember all of that stuff from the very first synapsids back in, in the Carboniferous period all the way down to the late Triassic when we definitely have full-blown placental mammals and marsupials and monotremes is about 100 million years. That's a long time. This is not a blindingly fast process that's going on. It involves the main, and the reason why we have such a good evidence for it is one, because the damn teeth are so bloody durable. So that gives us a track of a lot of that. And the other fact is that um, up until the Triassic, uh, the synapsids were the dominant land animals, herbivores and, and predators. And yeah. so we get, we have a bigger chance of capturing them than the little piddly ass little diapsids that were like doing nothing until that late Triassic period. And, and in until that period that, now, as the yeah, climate the, is shifting. The one, two punch of not only the Permian extinction, but right after or it's a Triassic extinction, right, at, right, at, pretty much right after yeah, we don't yet know enough about the metabolisms involved, but we know that, boy, that Permian extinction changed the climate for a while. It really dropped oxygen levels enormously uh, to where uh, for a while in the Triassic, um, it, it was like, I think only about 15% oxygen or something like that in the atmosphere. And so anything that operated off of a really high oxygen metabolism is at a disadvantage that may have been part of the factors. We do know um, the, the, the rise of the teeter-totters. Uh, in the late Triassic, you get a whole slew of these increasingly bipedal diapsids, not just the dinosaurs, but the lagosuchids that are the racing crocodiles and all that stuff uh, going on. And, and the, the mammals by now are just appearing on the scene. The same deposits, the Ischwagolosto in Argentina and the... Uh, uh, um, uh, basins yeah. in South Africa and that, the, 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 the same so, places where we're getting these one, early dinosaurs, we're also getting the late, the, the very earliest. I know, once again, they beat us. <coughs> it's not just the kangaroos and the, and the primates at two legs, the, the diapsis beat us on two legs too. Yeah, yeah, well, di bipedality is a very specialized feature. Back, here, here we'll go a little walk down memory lane. Uh, back to the 1980s when I was just starting to research uh, in more great depth about dinosaurs and the like. And to me, I was very attracted to the bird dinosaur model because of the fact that birds are unlike a bat. The moment the bat lands on the ground, it reveals it's a quadruped. It clambers around on all fours. But birds are the only ones that are not just a big obligatory bipeds. They're just graceful at it. They don't even need their little wings. They can just tuck themselves in and just prance around and they can pick with their beaks and that if they're using that. They don't need to use arms. And uh, that that suggested that the most logical organism that that evolved from was something that was already bipedal. And for that, it just screamed dinosaurs because those are the group that, that were uh, habitual bipeds from the start and remain a great many lineages that were bipeds. Whereas bipedality is very rare in mammals. Uh, you mentioned kangaroos and us. There was also a little, um, if you're familiar with the Messel formation, are you from the um, uh, Germany? Does no, it ring a bell? I am that. I am, I am it's, now. It's one of those famous Lagerstätten. We're going we're gonna to talk a little about Lagerstätten here. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a super duper, it's M-E-S-E-L, Messel, and it's really famous. It's about 55 million years ago in Germany, and it's basically a toxic waste dump of organisms because it's got all sorts of oxygen deprivation and stuff. So organisms that die in it got preserved really well. So we've got the, some of the earliest bats are known from the mesal formation. And on, on top of which, a funky little critter about the size of a rabbit that is, as far as we found so far, unique in being that teeter-totter approach of a balanced body with a long tail that balances on its hind legs. Apparently, it, it wasn't a really good model 
because it didn't lead anywhere. Speaking of, of walking, I, it's true not, not, I heard somewhere in the Permian time, I, I think, I think, maybe, I think is we started walking differently than the reptile brands did. We said, well, like, like the dinosaurs, we start developing upright gait, but it's built a bit differently because it's quadrupedal and it produces a dynamic uh, for of uh, uh, for run, foreground running. In fact, that I, I, as I think about it right off hand, I can't think of a single rapid four legged dinosaur. They're all pretty slow. Whereas, look, think of all of the fast quadrupedal runners we have in the mammals. Cheetahs, lions, tigers, uh, dogs, uh, a gazelle. Uh, <laughs> you know, that, that, um, but that also puts a constraint on the dynamics because it limits the uh, range of um, vertebrates you can shift, the vertebrae along the body that you, if you accidentally by mutation add too many, it becomes awkward. So there's a huge, there's been dynamic studies and I think I may have cited them either in Slam Dunk or uh, uh, Rocks were there, uh, that there is, is kind of a selection pressure that restricts that vertebral dynamic uh, with mammals. Uh, dinosaurs are in a completely different kettle of fish. When you get to be a big bipedal critter, now you can run. And all you need to do is to be able to balance your body. And so you have that long tail that allows you to turn in a dime because you can shift the body around in very complex ways. And they're now also doing computer modeling and that even of how the, uh, the things operate. So when you get into that much specialization, you're partly opening up niches that you wouldn't be able to do before. At the same time, you're also constrained because there's things you can't do as well because you're stuck with the four legs or two legs. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'll talk to dinosaurs again. It's 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 it's, it's like, like whale, whales and stuff. How like whales went from the sea from the land sea to land back to sea again, and di some dinosaurs went from four legs to two legs back to four legs again. Yeah. Well, there's var variations on the thing. In fact, um, uh, probably a good example of a uh, of a leg switch would be the bipedal cetacosaurs uh, that eventually developed into the little quadrupedal protoceratopsids, and then from there into the fully bigger uh, jumbo version triceratops type uh, ceratopsids. And by that time, you're, you're sufficiently massive that you've just basically given up that bipedal bit and you're entirely quadrupedal. Other of the dinosaurs had it both ways, uh, ambifoidal, I suppose you could argue, the hadrosaurs, where they, they can balance uh, myosaurs and parasaurolophus and all the rest are still able to balance nicely on their hind legs, probably using their front legs for a lot of locomotion, but they can also balance on that and rear up higher and all of that. And so they have a little bit different dynamic than the fully quadrupedal stegosaurids and, uh, and uh, triceratopsids. Whereas the mammals, almost entirely restricted to that quadrupedal base. Anyway, back to our little jaw thingy that's going on. So we, we've got the, the, once you've got that new jaw structure operating, there's a whole cascading network of things. One thing because we jaws can move differently because it's now the dentary squamosal format. Um, and also we've got those specialized teeth modes so they can go separate selection pressure so you can get into more and more niches. You can uh, go after uh, um, um, by uh, establishing certain kind of giant overhanging fangs, that saber tooth model that pops up over and over again in uh, uh, various mammal groups that's highly specialized to attack a particular prey, which again is getting yourself down a road that if the prey goes extinct, you go extinct because you're too specialized. That's all you eat. Uh, that's another factor. Then the hearing, it's probably no coincidence that bats developed as tiny insectivorous critters that were nocturnal that could hear better because they co-opted those extra ear bones and echolocation and all the things that come with it that can develop in that that you won't be able to find. There's a tiny bit of echolocation characteristics that occur in some ba uh, birds, by the way. And I alluded, to, we alluded to that in, um, I think in, um, uh, the rocks were there uh, because that had just come along recently. And there's even a case of a parrot that has developed a secondary jaw muscle 
in a way that's very similar to the, what happened uh, in the synapsid. So that gives you some clues about the developmental mechanisms that, that were going on even in that. It, it's, it's, it's an oddity that's popped up um, in a species of parrot. <laughs> Speaking of, of jaws and ears, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, just, is, is the, 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 like the, our, the mammal ears, different reptile ears, right? That's a, Right. Hearing is a hearing is a funky thing. Yeah. Uh, the the basal system is that stapes bone that goes way back into um, late fish, and uh, that is the standard one that everybody is built off of. Yeah. But the other issue involves how many parts of the bone system you can use to sense vibrations with, and it turns out the sensory awareness of like things that your jaw can pick up. Uh, that's something that even the uh, uh, um, uh, the cetaceans make use of to this day is they make use of of clicks that they put up in some cases in a big uh, a bag of, of, of goo uh, in some of the uh, whales. In others, they're making clicks with their jaw and and they can feel that coming back in through the thing. So there is a, a there's a, a huge gradation of how organisms hear. And okay. uh, when you look to see how much variety there is, it, yeah. it clarifies the kind of things, almost the same genes will be involved because they're involving signaling systems and the way yeah. to process acoustic information. Um, um, you have various convergence on the shape of that little eardrum structure because it produces, yeah. vi it, it settles in a, in a little hair assembled sack that, will be able to tell orientation. You can feel when your head goes from one side to another. And so the shape of that and, and the curvature of that can attenuate as to how much hearing you have and, and yeah. whether or not that they've discussed because there's variations with the Neanderthals, what kind of hearing they would have had yeah. compared to Homo sapiens. Yeah, but like, but like the mammal brands compared to the, the synaptic brands compared to the, to the we have, I think we have the more, external ears and then the other than the diapsis do uh pretty much yeah and and we have a whole bunch of things uh, uh lips that's very mammal um uh, there's uh, there's the the skins that you find around uh, um these extra features but we definitely have a specialized ear and all you have to do is to look at something like an elephant to think about just how spectacular hearing can go you find uh, animals with very precise hearing, little foxes and stuff that's got gigantic ears that can just very carefully locate the tiniest little rustle of sound. Uh, not that um, uh, the dinosaurs wouldn't, have, many of them would have had quite good hearing because you can tell how much processing's power is devoted to it by brain endocasts. This is another area that you probably won't find many creationists talking about because there's an awful lot of brains available and they can do tomography analyses. And because you know which parts of the brain do what, we know that, that uh, tyrannosaurs had fairly good hearing, but they had definitely good smell. Wow, they got olfactory, boy. They, and, and that brings up the argument as to how much tyrannosaurs were like uh, 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 carrion predators, you know, waiting for something to get killed by something else and then come in and chase all the other animals away because you're bigger. Uh, and uh, that, that probably played a role in that. So you get so many different adaptations going on uh, and we can see the dynamics of what's happening with the mammals is they're slamming into a world that's changing climate in the Triassic that's increasingly being dominated by very proliferating early dinosaurs that can just run really fast because they're quick bipeds that are fully erect that probably have a better bang for the buck out of their metabolism that even if oxygen levels are slightly lower for a while, um, that they probably were able to process that better in their internal metabolism. And that may have given them a leg up. And uh, so the mammals don't disappear because the dinosaurs, not exclusively necessarily, but are probably primarily daytime animals. And they sleep and hunker down at night. And the mammals can get out and have good night vision and good night hearing and they're really tiny. And although by the time you get down to the late dinosaur period, you're starting to get bigger mammals. You're getting mammals that are large enough that they could wrestle a small dinosaur to the ground. 
and they're like wombat have, size. Hmm? Do we still have our night? Do we still have night vision now as us, or have we lost that? Uh, well, uh, well, it depends on the person. And again, there's enormous variation on there. Uh, in some respects, all the vertebrates, the diapsids have us beaten in so many ways. Birds, for example, can see into the ultraviolet. We can't. Although once in a while, you can find a human being who has a variation that they can kind of see a wider range than what we're used to. Uh, most mammals don't focus on color vision, particularly, uh, or they see in semicolor. Whereas um, primates, and especially us, have full color vision. And that, again, they've worked out the mutations and things that can happen on that. And, and you have to wonder what kind of selection pressure was involved. It's, it's great for seeing ripe fruit. And so organisms that can see things in color, uh, if you're, what you're eating is colorful, uh, has a different dynamic to it. Um, the, the, the range of stuff, we're, we're hampered in part with the dinosaurs because they're all extinct. So we have to look at everything well, secondarily okay. from what birds can do. Well, when you say all dinosaurs are extinct, you mean the, the not bird ones, of course. The non-avian ones, yeah. 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 And, and therefore, everything we want to know about dinosaurs, you have to look at birds. But birds are a specialized niche. And, and uh, uh, even though probably a lot can be revealed and is revealed about it, uh, it's telling you a bit less about what might be going on in a sauropod or in an ornithischian dinosaur that's so far removed in terms of that common ancestry with the theropods, there's so much time frame involved. The early differentiation of these major groups is again back in the Triassic uh, that um, one should always be careful about extrapolation from one taxa that far removed than the other. And in the same way that knowing what's going on in monotremes doesn't necessarily constrain what might have been going on in Gorgonopsids a hundred million years earlier that may have had a very different enough of a kit bag that you can't make those inferences now from it. And you said earlier that our earlier were, were less of a, of a niche thing and more special, not, not specialized, but like we're, we're, or we're maybe herbivores, not herbivores, uh, in insectivores, and we could get In general, uh, um, and somebody can scream at me in the live chat or in um, uh, comments on that later, but if I'm just going by my experience with the vertebrates in general and the history of the evolutionary process, uh, not for insects, you know, you know too many insects, uh, but in vertebrates, it kind of looks like all adaptive radiations, things that eventually start that make really a lot of changes later on, they're very generalized and not terribly specialized to start out with. So you have a thing that's that's the earliest groups of so many different critters that are closely related look really a lot alike. Jackson uh, was just mentioning about if you look at the very earliest serenians, the manatees, uh, sea cows, and uh, the earliest elephants, Probosidians and that they they're not that far apart, and and if you were to look at either one of those together, would you be able to go well? That one's going to eventually turn out to be a sea critter, and that one's going to breed a group of really big terrestrial herbivores. D could you anticipate that? I do. I couldn't. And and uh, the idea that that uh, another factor that comes in there's a oh I think his name is Vermage. Yeah, I guess you could tell. I guess you couldn't tell it by the 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 shape. Maybe you could tell it by the location. If they are maybe if they are near the near to the coast and the ocean, they might you might assume they yeah, maybe the man. That, the, um, uh, the one thing that, that that Jackson was pointing out, their teeth, is that the ancestors of the Serenians were really good and uh, for eating plants that would be on the shore. And in the water, the way hippos and others can do today. Whereas um, the critters that eventually moved off into elephants are more explicitly land animals. And so those can make an effect. One of the reasons why cetaceans developed as they did out of the artiodactyls is artiodactyls can breathe through their nose easily. And that ultimately is an enormous advantage if you eventually reposition your nose pointing upward where all you have to do is to breach the water and go... <laughs> and then take a breath and dive back down again because you don't have to breathe through your mouth. So tiny, tiny variations in that are not specializations to start with.
can eventually lead to very great niches that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise, depending upon the circumstances of things. And none of those things ever take like like a week. Uh, you know, they're they're involving millions and millions of years, and and we always need to. Uh, uh, some of the creationists would talk about well. Boy, whale evolution seems to be really happening pretty fast. It's only like four or five million years. Do you realize how long that is? That's from the Australopithecines to Philip Johnson and Donald Trump. That's that's four million years. <laughs> that's a lot of change. That's still that's longer than the four thousand years they give us. Yeah. Well, yes, and that, that's a different matter in, in terms of they're never going to make their little uh, uh, bit uh, um, uh, compress. So the reptile mammal transition for me is what made me into an evolutionist. For, there was no way I could get around it because uh, if, uh, I, the way I put it snarkily in Slam Dunk, I said, if God didn't want me to believe in evolution, he shouldn't have created therapsids. Now, that was just a big mistake because it was just a dead giveaway. Uh, and the fact that, that um, uh, it's so incredibly ignore. One of the reasons why I wrote the book is because when I was thinking back about all the subject matters that hadn't been covered a lot, I realized that all the stuff on the reptile mammal transition was basically scattered in a few little side comments in books, a paragraph or two. And I'm going, shit, this is spectacular. You need to know more about this. You need to know the whole shebang. There's so much going on here. And because a uh, mammal Mammals uh, are seemingly less sexy and spectacular. I mean, since when do you see the, the, the uh, an equivalent of Jurassic Park for mammals? They just don't tend to do that. So um, it, it's not that an enormous amount of fascinating evolution was taking place uh, involving changes in metabolism and all that. But, but when you looked at them, you would be seeing, oh, this is a new model of mouse. I mean, it's f uh, just a little furball. Welcome to Permian Park. Yeah, yeah. And um, but in in terms of what ha would happen later on, c given how spectacularly diverse mammals have turned out to be, everything from terrestrial organisms to whales, the biggest organisms that have ever lived in the history of like ever uh, and and those incredible bats, most most mammals are bats and rats. You got you got twelve hundred species of of just bats. Now that is a successful group, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so we're true we're true official mammals in the Triassic or Jurassic. Uh, by the by the late Triassic, you have full blown mammals. That that um, remember the history of this is always when can you find the earliest and. Um, it was the case that when I was growing up, it was thought that you didn't really find full mammals until the Cretaceous period. That They were just little teeny mice that were coming up and the little mice were going around and eating the dinosaur eggs. And that's why the dinosaurs died out. You know, oh, that yeah, was the yeah I, I had that too. It's weird now. When I was, I, I was elementary school in the 80s, in the 80, ladies, I was elementary school. And, and now, and, and now I, you know, what the asteroid I I did not know the asteroid was, wasn't a thing until until the early nineties. Yeah, well, it was starting to come into the literature in the nineteen eighties on, and I was uh, steeping in that. What was more interesting is the thing that it's not that the asteroid didn't hit. Chichilub happened, but let's not forget that wasn't the only thing that was happening because before the asteroid hit, the Deccan traps of India. There was a mega plume volcanic eruption thing going on. India by that time was parked over, I think, the Reunion Island hotspot in the middle of the Indian Ocean. And we can still find the other half of the stuff down in there. So it had moved northward from, from Antarctica and Australia and was heading across the uh, Indian Ocean. Uh, that was disastrous for the uh, ocean system. Yeah. And so the, the dinosaurs might not have completely died out. Uh, even with out uh, without the asteroid impact, but uh, yeah. certainly it wasn't any more help for him. Yeah, I I, I don't know if it's true or not, but I heard by the time the asteroid hit, the the, the some of the non avian with non avian dinosaurs were getting less and less diverse than they were before. Yeah, the um, there was an awful lot of specialization going on uh, in in North America, for example. Most all of the predators were tyrannosaurs, and most all of the prey were ceratopsids. That's all your eggs in one basket ecosystem. 
Another factor was that the, the oceanic system, those plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs and pliosaurs and all of those sores that were knocking around, uh, that had already started to collapse in part because of all the gases that were being thrown out, not only carbon dioxide, but sulfur dioxide and other stuff, ocean acidification, there was stuff going on that was making life unky uh, in the oceans before the, the big stumbling block. And yet, and yet, frogs made it through. Branches of crocodiles made it through. One of the groups of birds, that's another big mystery to me, because um, we have to remember that the dominant birds, they're, they're, have you heard of the enanternithines? Another cute little complicated word that I've only just figured out how to spell. Let, let me I, let me type that I, into I, the I live chat before, here. I think. Enanti ornithine. I think this yeah, is I th it. I've, I've heard that word before. Are they on the true bird it, branch it or means, the side bird? It means the opposite birds. And it has to do, I, I, as a, if memory serves me, it's the way the shoulder blade attaches. And it's what sockets into what. It's the, the enanternithines are the opposite of the way that the, the birds we all know the ornithines are laid out and we still don't know how that occurred what what lineage caused that little shift to take place and what was going on developmentally we don't have the, the smoking gun on that one but the take home is that all through the cretaceous period which is a long time the enantronithines are the dominant birds they almost all of the the, the major bird groups are enantronithines and the the although apparently the groups that eventually lead to the birds we're familiar with can be traced back into little niches in the Cretaceous. They're not big players. On top of which, we now know that there's a whole bunch of flappy dinosaurs. You've got those micro raptors and the, the Yi Chi thing with the bat wings with feathers, and you've got a whole slew of stuff going on there. Busy, busy, plus the pterosaurs that have kind of faded away for the small uh, bird-sized ones, but the great big monster Cessna-sized gliders are still doing quite nicely, thank you very much. All of that changes with the, with the uh, Cretaceous extinction. And all of those other flyers go extinct, except for the birds, the ornithine birds. Tiny little group that somehow or other, was it luck of the draw or something they did a little better? Were they... The, uh, another feature that we have to deal with is that um, the birds hadn't quite finalized all of their evolution either. Some of the fully flow through metabolism of modern birds probably developed after the KT. But certainly one of the things that made the, the birds that were successful is that they were developing powerful sternums for muscle attachment. That allows them to take off from the ground without jumping from something. Uh, Archaeopteryx didn't have that. The earlier birds didn't have those. So that means that um, uh, the, the phrase I love with Archaeopteryx is uh, somebody, I think it was uh, Henry Gee said, uh, Archaeopteryx could fly better than a sack of potatoes. Uh -huh. <laughs> that it was, it, it was a glider, but not a super, superb flyer. So why did those others die out? We don't know. So what's the difference? Like the mammals, like mammals said real fast. Uh, yeah. What's the difference between, do we, we know between a mammal um, a mammal form and a mammal morph. Oh well, the, the both both of those terms are used. Mammalia formes and mammalia morph. You find the same thing. Dinosaur formes, sauropod morpha. Uh, that both words mean pretty much the same thing. And I, what I, it would be, it, it would be systematically the almosts, the groups okay. that aren't quite what the diagnostic is, because remember for a full blown mammal, it's got to have an articular quadrate uh, um, bone up in the ear. It's got to have the dentary squamosal jaw hinge. Uh, and I think there are a couple other diagnostics that go on that, that make it a firm, maybe, maybe firm milk mammal. Producing. Hmm? Milk, milk, milk producing at this point. Uh, yeah, they probably were. Yeah. Uh, that's another thing that makes mammals distinctive glands. Uh, birds have relatively few glands. Uh, they also don't urinate. Mammals urinate. So that's another uh, specialized feature. They poop. Birds will poop, but not, not urinate. And so the waste processing system is clearly very, very different in mammals. And one of the things that's the reason why there's the mammalia formes or mammalia morph, however you want to call them, is because there's indications that so many of those features are not appearing all in one lump. 
that they're they're occurring incrementally in varying lineages and to get to the thing where it's now to that point that's really true of all the major things the same thing with the dinosaurs uh we're seeing that with um uh look how blurry australopithecines are as to which ones uh might be the group that mammal uh, humans developed from and uh, it's true in pretty much everything. Get used to it. This is because you're seeing what, even though you're only seeing the tip of the iceberg on the fossils, what we can see is a lot of iceberg tips. Yeah, I heard that. Ooh, hi, brain bug. Uh, like, like only one percent of the species ever survived, and ninety-nine percent of the species in the history of the world have died out. At least. Yeah, and and, and we're, uh, although this doesn't mean they have bad runs, I think the kind of average for a vertebrate is something on the order of like twenty million years, which means we're really new kids on the block. Um, and even in the uh, things that we can see, uh, Neanderthals uh, were on Earth way longer than our species has been, and uh, yet you know they fizzle out. And the and the issue is why is it luck of the draw? Or is it you finally run out of steam and you and you you make one bad mutation too many and that finally does you in, and this is still an uncertain thing that that connects up with modern environmental policy because we don't necessarily know what screws what up to cause mass extinctions, and the fear yeah, of many ecologists is that we might be triggering such a thing now with our gumming up the environment. Yeah, I, I still want to know which if we will survive or if we survive between Homo Earthians and, and Homo Martians. Yeah, <laughs> and that's another that that's one of the things that, in some respects, though, we change the parameters. You and I are both short circuiting evolution. We wear glasses. Yeah. So we've now disconnected the selection pressure for bad eyesight. Yeah. We wear clothes. We yeah, heat our houses. So yeah, we've disconnected more, that connection. I think I think we're going more of artificial selection than natural selection. Yeah. Now, given how enormously long that would take, uh, it's possible that you know if we ever develop faster, and there's another factor: geographic isolation. If you have the case that in order to get to like space colonies, you have to build gigantic arc ships where you go, bye, we're never ever going to see you again. Go away, make a colony, send us a message by light speed because it's going to be really hard to talk to you. Uh, then mm -hmm. those circumstances are probably will be that the, the colonists will develop in different ways over time that make make them a new species relative to us. If we have Star Trek super fast warp drive to where you can visit them all the time and communicate rapidly, then that may not occur. And so you would be just like us, um, that we would be constantly gene flowing in such a way that you don't really have an evolutionary dynamic. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so we've got the we got the different jaw bones separating than the walking and the ears. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Um, well, we do know we have a, a um, specialized heart. We have uh, there's a vertebrate immune system that mammals have hitchhiked on to make the kind of antibody based system that we use an awful lot of, and that pops up when we're trying to talk about how to make viruses and vaccines and all that stuff. Um, that's another dynamic that's going on. Um, and then eventually we get the thing about how distinctive is our mammal brains in terms of uh, cortex size and other factors, because they're finding out more and more about how smart non-mammals can be, how a, a bird brain, well, crows are remarkably smart. And so we have to think through what it means to be intelligent. But still, we have a very, very distinctive uh, structure. Now, um, when we get down to us human beings, now you and I are doing something that's really special, is we're communicating with grammatical language. Yeah. And that really puts it. other. The roots of language, they're just starting to 
lay out the parameters of a lot of these things, <laughs> what genes are involved, and what this the stuff that's happening in the brain to create the sense of word order and nouns versus verbs and all of this stuff. And and now uh, it, it's they're just tiptoeing into it because we couldn't model or scan what was going inside the brain easily. And still it's hard to do in certain contexts, but that, yeah. that's something that's very, very distinctive. As far as we can tell, uh, even when we include cetaceans making songs like humpback whale songs and the like, that they're still mammals. And so we can't think of anything that's quite the same structure that's going on in anybody in other than the mammal side. So we've got some specialization features here. We seem to be uh, able to make use of fire in interesting ways uh, that other organisms tend to run from them. There are chimpanzees that actually will start fires in order to knowing that it's going to drive out competitors and other stuff so that there's some really dynamics that can go on in there. Uh, and that's, again, more mammal stuff. So, um, uh, yeah, eat it, eat your heart out, you bugs. you got your 500,000 species, but we're the only ones that make hamburgers with onions. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh. <coughs> anyway, I hope that's clearer about how the jaw developed and why that's something that is, is so extraordinarily spectacular and a prediction of evolution and the thing that allows... It's the reason why I didn't have to do a PowerPoint because cool. everybody's got a jaw. Everybody's got a zygomatic arch. Everybody's got ears. You now have the tools to explain to anybody anywhere about the evolution of the synapsids into mammals and thumb your nose at them when they try to say there's no macroevolution evidence. We literally carry it around with it in our body. We've got a question. Hmm. Oh, boy, brain bug, you want to just break our brains. Ever wonder why insular gigantism leads to neoteny and archosaurs, but not lepidosaurs? I do not have a clue. <laughs> the one you might want to ask that of is Dapper Dino, and he may not have an answer either, but he's much more in that dinosaur field than I am yeah. even. Uh, uh, I know the terminology. The neoteny thing, for those of you who don't understand that, that's the retention of juvenile characteristics into adulthood. And so what we're saying is that archosaurs, which would be including crocodiles and um, uh, groups that outside of the standard reptile line, but that uh, a crocodilian group, and you would be including pterosaurs and that kind of thing. Lepidosaurs, if memory serves me as an extinct or limited group of ones more in the reptile block, but I would have to look them up because uh, I think even Jackson knows more about lepidosaurs than I do. So now the question is that, when an organism gets bigger, why is it that archosaurs are not are are like baby expanded versions of babies, whereas lepidosaurs are different from that? And I would postulate that something's going on in the genes, that there's a whole dynamic of what happens when you scale up an organism and what um, regulatory agents are in play. And I would suspect that um, uh, if lepidosaurs have any uh, uh, living uh, descendants, theoretically, you should be able to pick out what kind of regulatory gene systems are involved. If, yeah. um, if not, if they're extinct, then screw it. You probably won't be able to do that easily without being able to retro engineer the genetics. And that's not for, probably for the 21st century to figure out. Yeah. <laughs> no, if, sorry, time travel over a minute and I can go back. I, I would... I would rename some of the stuff that we we name now. It, it, it doesn't make any sense now. Like one, like wisdom teeth, the teeth that really get in your jaw, and it's not is that very smart. Yeah. Well, I, they I, they come about by a variety. I think probably the term came about from referring to a word that didn't mean wisdom. It probably has an entomology that's screwball and that that led to that. But just in the discussion that uh, Dapper Dino and. Uh, Oh, gosh, who else was involved? Jackson and, and a few others um, uh, were uh, chit-chatting with a creationist. And uh, Dan McRae brought up, or Steve McRae brought up something that I hadn't known about. But, boy, it's going to be in rocks, too. That there's a portion of our human population that is developing another vein in their arm. Uh, and I, gradually this is spreading through where eventually all human beings will possess that extra vein. And it's, yeah, I, it's literally evolution in action. 
Yeah, and I, I, I would also go back and rename dinosaurs like terrible birds instead of terrible lizards. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, the uh, uh, you have to remember back in the 1850s, they had no precedent for anything else. They knew it was like a reptile thing. And remember, they didn't have any synapsids or anything like that. You could tell right off the bat it was no mammal because no zygomatic arch. Nah, 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 nah. It would be easy to tell apart from that point of view. Um, but where did it fall into it? They knew it was sort of reptile-y. And, and they, that, for a long time, they were conceiving of those in that term. So Iguanodon was depicted. Uh, there were the famous sculptures. I think some went through and some idiot... Uh, um, um, hit them with sledgehammers or something, which is terrible. Uh, that's in the um, park where the old uh, uh, 1850s exhibition was. And uh, they were basing their depictions of Iguanodon and these other critters uh, on what reptiles look like. So Iguanodon is depicted as this big quadrupedal lizardy like thing yeah. um, that's very different from what it actually looked like. But given what they had available at the time, um, you know, cut him some slack, gang. You know, <laughs> it just had pieces. Yeah, the Crystal Palace. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I. Oh, let me let uh, me jump in. Brainbug says I kept my cool very well with the frustrating Mister Batman. Yeah, I debated him a little. Uh, uh, if you've seen me on that, there was one moment when I wanted to like strangle him because he was interrupting so much. But by and large, yeah, I kind of kept my cool and that I went to pantomime mode where I was putting the, the, the uh, uh, cell phone timer up to remind people of him going on and 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 on with the same thing. Yeah, yeah I, I listened to some of that thing. It was just uh, like this same old catchphrase I've heard before. Yeah, we were discussing whether dinosaurs and humans coexisted, which the short answer is no. Well, <laughs> well, technically, yes. Well, with birds, but I mean, they, uh, they, you don't know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, I made a joke about that. Like, the dinosaurs seem to be man, like, yes, and they are delicious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yeah, just absolutely uh, the Kentucky Fried Dinosaur. Oh, and the other thing that's that's of interest in relation to our little mammal bunch is the as yet unconfirmed issue of exactly when bats developed. Because um, the all the genetic phylogenies tend to suggest that bats were developing sometime in the late Cretaceous, which means they're entering in the biz of flapping at the same time that there were the late pterosaurs and a bunch of different competing birds. Even though we only have the earliest fossils of bats um, about uh, 10 million years after the KT, and they're already pretty bat-like uh, with rudimentary echolocation and that sort of thing. Uh, uh, also, speaking of evolution and the guy that hated Dar the guy that hated Darwin, the guy who the guy who found the dinosaurs and stuff, he, he wasn't even a YC. He, he, uh, he was like, I think he was an OEC, older creationist, I think. Oh, uh, well, I can't think of, I, I can't think of it. Uh, oh, well, R Richard Owen um, yeah. named them. He wasn't, he didn't do a huge amount of work in the field. He just kind of gave him a name. Uh, he definitely, what, he, he falls in an awful lot of the non-evolutionists of that period yeah. are kind of squishy because oh. they don't necessarily disallow a lot of interrelationships. They just didn't think it through very much. But I think, but I think, and, he, was an, uh, I think he, was a, he was definitely an OEC, not a YEC. Oh, yeah. Well, there, weren't, there functionally weren't any young Earth creationists in the scientific community by then. Uh, um, that uh, pretty much everybody in the geological community uh, knew that the Earth was old. And that's when they start. You have to give some sympathy to the, to the gear shift that was taking place at that time. And there have been several science gear shifts like that uh, since. But um, in the period from the late 18th century into the mid 19th century, they went from a world in which species must be fixed and there were a relatively few of them and they were kind of mentioned in the Bible and so it was nice and neat and tidy and maybe the earth was only a few thousand years old but they didn't really matter because it didn't affect anything. To where by the 1850s they knew the earth must be millions of years old and that there had been extinction events, that animals had gone extinct. This scared the shit out of a lot of religious people because they thought, what? wasn't the creation perfect? How can we have extinct animals? 
and even Thomas Jefferson was thinking maybe somewhere out there there was a, a population of woolly mammoths that they could find, and he was actually instructing the uh, uh, Lewis and Clark expedition. You know, keep your eye out for them. You, if you see any, let us know. Well, technically, uh, the and, woolly mammoths were, were still like were very recent. Uh, we should well, and we're smelling. The young earth creationist Andrew Snelling actually does argue in this modern time that all of the mammoths and mastodons evolved from the ark kind after the flood yeah. and then went extinct. Like, like, wasn't there like an island of mammoths only about 2,000 years ago? Oh, well, that, yo, there, one, well, I don't think quite that young. I think it's like 15 or 20,000, something like that. Um, or maybe 2,500 anyway, but it was, it, it was a ways back. Uh, up off of uh, Wrangell Island or something like that, off of Russia or up in the Arctic, something like that. That's a case of miniaturization where the little tiny little, little cute little mammoths running around uh, that um, uh, lived on a relatively tight land, uh, landscape, and they can survive quite a long time if they don't have any predators to knock around. But then um, Darwin's evolution came along that completely upset that. And then in the 20th century, then we get more gear shifts because, of course, relativity theory and quantum theory came along in the 20th century. And suddenly, like, what do you mean space is curved and atoms aren't make like little billiard balls with little electrons running around them like planets? I mean, what, what, what are you, crazy? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so all of that threw everybody off uh, again. Uh, we're probably going to be facing some of the same kinds of gear shifts uh, with working out what dark matter is in the universe and um, uh, some of the things about uh, whether string theory and multiverses are true or not and whether we can never make detectors to find out. Um, but, you know, so so don't, don't get pushed out of shape. You know, the, the science improves. But the one things that never change are the facts. So all the observations stay the same, even if one expands the perspective to understand more about what they do. So we understand a falling hammer differently than Aristotle would, but Hammer still fell in his time. He just didn't understand what it was going on gravitationally. So science-wise, what's one thing that you wish we could do that we can't do, that we wish we could do? Oh, wow, just the one. Yipes. Uh, probably for me, the thing that would be most useful for the civilization and the future is we need to be able to travel faster than light. That's true, too. For me, well, I, I just get that answer, but I always wanted to get, uh, we get, get find out DNA, actual, actual DNA from fossils or, or older than we can now. I, I think it'd be awesome, mm. like really narrow down. In a way, that's one that we can end run because once you. We don't, we're not at that stage yet, but the paleogenomics ultimately can retro-engineer ancient organisms in principle. Yeah. The more you understand for what things do, the more you can work out experimentally what had to have happened in order to do the thing you do. And probably the test case that would be the most interesting are those Ediacara biota, the stuff that's before the Cambrian explosion like 600 million yeah. years ago, the weird little palm fronds and floor mats and weird shit, that when we can figure out what the genes needed to have been to produce those, yeah, that'll tell us an awful lot about stuff. So in some respects, we won't necessarily need to do that. But that's if we don't get faster than light drive, wow, the universe yeah. is really big. We're screwed. Well, that was... Like I said, that, that was really... The specialized drive that that really we will be able to speciate on different plants then. But, yeah. But, but yeah. I guess about DNA things like it's weird because because I I remember, I, remember, I remember reading about this I remember about this like before we had that we had specific branches of animals but once we got the DNA on the gene stuff some of them shift some of the things that we they shift around a little bit. Well, yes, yeah, because we were looking at the morphology rather than the genes is that things, well, one of the big shocks that took place in the 1980s and 90s was the recognition uh, that of the underlying uh, structural genes of organisms. You look at a cockroach and us, you think, well, that's different. 
So there must be radically different genetic systems involved in all of that. And so the biologists really were expecting the genes of your bug and a vertebrate to be so completely discordant that there would be some dim and distant thing that could have ever been the, the common ancestor to it. Then they discovered homeobox genes, where it turns out that the variations on and permutations and mixes of those homeobox genes is what makes a cockroach and us, not a completely different, different toolkit. And that means that the common ancestral systems can be much closer in time in the Cambrian than we would have thought back in the 1960s or 50s when we didn't know about those common architectural genes. Yeah, like like, la like last year when Jackson was on my ch last, me and Jackson were talking about how before the genetics, pr the bats were th bats were thought to be more more closely on the primate side, and now they're all over over on the. Some of that was to do with teeth. Some of that was to do with some of the other anatomical fa factors. And what, what has really changed all the field is the application of cladistics, where they start paying attention and, and quantifying things. And then you work backwards and also to connect up as many more factors involved. Uh, but it's understandable why they would have made those sort of choices, because you would have been looking at things that look kind of similar. And if you don't know the genes that are producing them, well, the, this is a revolution that has only happened recently to where within my lifetime, it's gone from where we didn't even know what DNA did to working out homeobox genes and cis regulatory cascades and uh, uh, alternative splicing. That was another big revolution because the assumption was we've got 100,000 proteins in our body. There must be one gene for each protein. That makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. The idea that there's only 25,000 genes and one gene can make this protein A by reading it forwards and protein B by reading only a portion of it or protein C by reading backwards from the other direction. And holy moly, and this one's different when you unplug the introns and there are all the spicers. Wow, that was another revolution. And that also indicated how much diversity and variation can occur in this shuffleboard of gene duplications and introns and retrotransposons and epigenetic markers and all of that. And part of the problem that people defending evolution need to have, and it's definitely a problem for creationists, is you have to think of all of these layers of biology happening simultaneously. So you've got cells replicating and mutations occurring and regulatory systems operating in which mutations can occur and structural genes and duplications can occur there. And that's in an organism and the organism is in a population and the population lives in an environment and there are parasites and there are predators and there's ecology and all of that's shifting because there's land masses moving around and plate tectonics and subduction and asteroid impacts. All of that's going on at the same time. Now your brain can that, that, easily before, go to the and point- that's before, yeah. And that's before even we got came, came along to mess things up. <laughs> Yeah. And, and it's very difficult in, in a way, as a historian, I hit that in a baby level because what happens, um, uh, I'll give an example from a, a thing that I finally was able to visit uh, Chaco Canyon in uh, New Mexico. I have been wanting to go there for years. It's out in the middle of shit ass nowhere. It is an effort to get to it. The nearest motel is 50 miles away. That that it's not a place that, it, that you do casually. And you're driving over arguably the worst road in the universe to get there. It's just terrible. But it's a magical, wonderful place. And there was one wall, when I visited the various kivas and things, there was one wall that was, I was walking along the trails on the back side, And there was one wall that's just a razor perfect squared off beauty that sticks up about 10, 15 feet, just perfect red stonework that's just intact. Most of the places, their sections falling apart and the things have separated, but this was just beautifully preserved. And I looked at that and I'm saying, who made that wall? We don't know their names. We don't know if they were men or women, if there was a team uh, 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 were they admired? Were they hated? Did they have ulcers? Uh, um, uh, how long did they go? How did they pass things on? But human beings of some sort connecting up there constructed that wall. All those 
800 years ago. And, and it frustrates me as a historian to not know anything about them. And yet the existence of the wall presupposes a whole social network that produced that wall. And it's the job of the historian to try to either work out what you can about it or recognize that there's a whole layer of that reality that would have occurred that you don't know because you can't get at the information. Now just multiply that by a billion and you're talking about the issues of working out evolution. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so off topic question. So when are your two books, Evolution Slam Dunk and Rocks with Air, going to be available for audio book and on Audible? <laughs> oh, I don't know when. Um, uh, I would. The problem with doing an audio book is on a science topic is what the hell do you do with the references? So theoretically, we'd have to pull out all of those and then just rework the text to be audiobook friendly. Uh, okay. Anybody out there that wants to assist in that, um, um, I'm open to it. Because I don't, I don't it's, know it's about the, the technical part, but if you, if you need a voice actor, I'm, I'm good at voice acting. <laughs> I, I can do the reading in that easily enough. I've already uh, written a source, a started work with me yeah. on the paralogs of fog thing but he's gotten oh. sidetracked on other projects and so that's kind of gotten into hiatus so it's that. an incomplete no, I, project I, I love there. That. I, and that's that. fiction where all you're doing is reading the text and the dialogue science works in audio book format unless they're generalized ones that aren't really information heavy but sorry uh, slam dunk and uh, rocks are really information heavy Man, and I so if i could be a an a, a audiobook voice actor like <laughs> the there, chapter two. Yeah, yeah, each one, each one doing their own little chapters on there. Yeah, it, it's an interesting format. In some respects, um, the ideal way of doing it in the future, because it's information, is that it can be done uh, for electronic formatting and and smartphones and the like, rather than rather than just the and then have the thing read the, read the text. But yeah, uh, I, I, we're I, still we're still just kind of plowing through all of that. Uh, Joel yeah, Wise says, "Yes, can... the description of Chaco Canyon's location." Uh, yeah, the, um, the, there's a, a wonderful number of preserved sites all through the Southwest in Arizona and uh, uh, in Colorado. And there's both uh, Pueblos that are cliff houses types. And there are other ones out uh, in northern Arizona, just uh, not that far from um, uh, the Grand Canyon uh, that are available. And every one of them is just an absolute delight to watch It's uh, and to see. You have a, a lost culture that existed there was a climate change that took place around 1200 that basically knocked a lot of the places around the world for a cocked hat. And that included the, the, uh, the Southwest. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll um, give you a little cover on that until you get back uh, onto the, uh, the microphone. Here he comes. Ta-da. Uh, yeah. There's so much shit to learn Lamont. That's the thing. The universe is just amazing, and we, we have so much out there. And that's what really pisses me off with people who are willfully ignorant. How dare people be stupid in the 21st century? We have no excuse for that. Yeah. It's not like you live in a cave. This stuff is accessible. We can get at it. Yeah, I got, I got the audio. I got the paper, the, the your book. Yeah, both of them are, uh, both of the books are available in, in, uh, um, uh, oh, Amazon's um, uh, Kindle Reader, and the, they're yeah, got, based got, on the um, uh, the uh, d the doc file, whereas the uh, print version is based on PDF. Yeah, I'm amazed that we can do all this stuff as well. It, it takes a lot um, to assemble the material; just the physical writing of it takes a while. And of yeah. course, uh, we we really want to make it as accurate and useful as possible. And it's all a learning curve on things. That's true. You know? I think I, I, true. I, I think Jackson said. Your paperback version it had more stuff than the than the the electronic version, or is that not true anymore? Oh, oh, the um, uh, um, I'm not sure whether or not the the index shows up. Is, is the index available on the book? The 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 the, the one you have on your e-reader? Let me see. Because someone was saying that he couldn't get the index for the rocks were there in the e-book, and that felt I uh, struck me as odd because I had one. Where would the index be? At the end or something? Be right at the, end, the tail end. Okay, let's see. Be right see. after all of the charts and stuff. See. Be after the bibliography, in fact. 
Soul Chapter 7. Chart, 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 chart. A lot of stuff Jeez. in there. <laughs> Which we have probably about 4,000 sources in it. Mm. The bibliography is quite extensive. But some somebody reviewed it on, on Amazon and said they couldn't find the index in it. It, it was missing that in the ebook. And that kind of annoyed me because is this I the definitely is this included the, get, get to thing. Levy index. Uh, no, that's a bibliography. Okay, it says after that. Yeah, it'd be right at the tail end, which would tell you what page number everything is on. Uh, it was all cross referenced, but slide ebook. Uh, yeah, that sure looks like the index. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so so the guy doesn't know how to access his reader. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, anyway, uh, slam dunk had like 2300 sources i actually uh, constructed a bibliography master index for that so i knew how how many were in that and uh, of all, it's on a highly specialized topic um when jackson uh suggested that we do the book um i i jumped at it it took me all of like a quarter of a second to say well sure and then finally it reached the point when we had assembled so much material that i dropped the bomb and said you know this is so big we're going to have to split this in two volumes. <laughs> you got you to gotta make a, a Lord of the Ring trilogy and not just one big book. Yeah. Well, but it, it and it'll be fun with the second volume because we'll be adding in material that's happened since uh, newer, newer technical literature and all the rest. And some of the wacky controversies that have popped up uh, and um, um, standing for truth and Nephilim and all that. Some of their little, little yeah. oddballs and, and uh, more geology material than that. So it, it will be um, uh, as up-to-date as the previous one was. We're, we're, so we're very you, proud of the thing. Yeah, do you, do you, do you make a, do you make, I can't talk. Do you need to make a sequel for your, for your Evolution Slam Dunk book too, or just, is that still? Oh, well, what, what I would like someday is if a regular publisher, hint, hint, if enough people buy it and so forth that people start paying attention to it, where we would do a, a second edition that would be illustrated and would be uh, updated. I have a whole stack of stuff downstairs that I keep track of for material that I would be adding in because I didn't put any illustrations in that in it and, and I didn't have the, the uh, rights to them. So I just said, which uh, I was in the situation where I needed the money. I needed to generate a book in a hurry and get some revenue going. And so I went ahead with what I could do and what I didn't have to get rights for. And um, away we go. But Christine Janis uh, said, the paleontologist, um, and said uh, that uh, all it needs is illustrations and this would be college level. And I go, duh. And that's why I would love to have um, a, a regular publisher who could do, um, mm. get the rights to all that stuff and make sure that and print it up in a nice uh, official way that you, that, that you, people you that are above my pay grade can do. Hmm? You need rights for illustrations? Oh, I know. The, I know all the illustrations I wanted in it. They were things I alluded to actually oh. in the text for a lot. There were wonderful charts and things that oh. listed off gene cascade sequences and the oh, stuff. I know, that, I know you need that, permission to get for that kind of stuff. Yeah, so it, it was a thing where I didn't have the uh, uh, the time to be able to slow down to to hunt it up and to oh, get okay. uh, pictures. And then there were also. Maybe... Also, a regular publisher would have an editor that they would go through and uh, uh, say, well, maybe you should tighten this section up and this section here probably should be improved and all that. Stuff. So anyway, so one way or one your, way your two books were, were self-edited and self-published? Yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, the reason why they don't seem too clumsy is because I'm a careful writer, and so is Jackson. And so we, we make sure they were vetted. We had people who would be reading through the sections. We know the material very well. Uh, even though technically a slam dunk was written by me solo, um, I, when um, uh, Christine Janis uh, wrote her review on it, there were no errors or anything in it uh, because I'm really careful. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, there were some occasional typographical glitches that I've caught, but other than that, the content uh, unlike some that just run off amok, um, sources mean things, content means stuff, and it's possible to write stuff in a rigorous, careful way. That's the way it does. I read a book once where the index was thicker than the text. <laughs> that, well, that, that's another thing that um, 
uh, that's a curious part though too. Um, uh, people will have noticed that I put in lots of source material and I try to be as careful as I can. The index for Slam Dunk is fairly basic, whereas I really pulled out the stops for uh, the rocks were there to make sure that every taxa name, every subtopic and everything was broken down in as accurate a way as possible to help you find information on it. So that's another and thing you you do if you ever re re republish the slam dunk, you're gonna do all that stuff too, more index? Yeah, yeah, I'd be, I'd be a more thorough index. I forgot to put speciation as an index topic in slam dunk. I, I looked at that and I go, holy shit, I missed that. <laughs> You know, you can get into, um, I, I spit it out in about nine months. That's how long it took me to write Slam Dunk. When, when was that, the, when was that, the 80s, 90s? Oh, no, no, no. I, I did the uh, Slam Dunk in um, 2016. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. And I, it, it had been right after um, I had done the Paralogs of Phileas Fogg and I, I was able to, um, realize, oh, people were telling me about publication things and I was able to discover Amazon's um, create space. And then I'm like a kid in a candy shop. I go, hey, I could do a science book knowing how to do this now. And so that's when I gear shifted over and wrote Slam Dunk and uh, the rest of the <coughs> so, so now, you Now you can, you can compare my book with Standing for Truth and Raw Matt's books. <laughs> Yeah. So you said, you, you said the, you said the mammal, the retarded mammal translation is, is what convinced you evolution was true. What, yeah. did, what do you think before, what do you, before that? Oh, well, I, I was skeptical of Darwinian evolution. I came okay. up in an environment where there were an awful lot of evolution critics I bumped into. Uh, Arthur Kessler, uh, and uh, oh, um, Mortimer Adler and uh, uh, several others that, that were dumping on evolution from a lot of different directions. And I didn't know a great deal about biology or paleontology at that time. This would have been in the 1970s. And only later on, what kind of knocked me off the fence was the creation science movement. Thank you, creation science. Uh, you could, I wouldn't have become an evolutionist if it weren't for you. <laughs> Um, the creation scientists were trying to get their equal time rules in at the time, early 1980s. And I recognized that that was really dumb. No, there were not dinosaurs on Noah's Ark. So I started researching that. And one of the books that I'd read, I think the Zetterberg uh, anthology, um, had a chapter in it on the reptile mammal transition, which I had not known about. And I start looking through all of this stuff and the, and the transitional animals and all of this. And I'm going, whoa. And then I kicked myself because I knew about so many of those critters because they were in my little dinosaur set from a kid, but I'd never connected the dots. Yeah. And so I could have known about more of that information. Although in retrospect, I was actually happy that I didn't get into it earlier because the biology has advanced so much more um, that the kinds of stuff that endosymbiosis and, uh, uh the homeobox genes, that those were only discovered in the 1990s, that, that doing so much of my research in the late 1990s was an advantage because I didn't have to unlearn stuff that I would have been carried as baggage if I had studied it more in the 1970s. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it was, it was less of science and more of history that got me to start dying. Next, cause, I was, Cause I was thinking like, I like I'm thinking like my brain like wait a minute how could the flood happen four thousand years ago if Native Americans were crossing the land bridge ten thousand years ago I'm like oh yeah that's I'm a like, that's I'm a like persistent problem and, and it's not just the American Indians it's all the people in Oceania it's people in China and Africa that when you look at the creationist literature themselves it's like pulling teeth to get them to pay attention to the rest of the world and when they do they really have to ignore most of the data. So that's true of Nathaniel Jensen. There, there's a bunch of stuff that's been popping with him and Tompkins and others that are trying to somehow show that the haplotypes can make sense from their flood model, but they're still not dealing with the archeology span that yeah. we have just way too much information and, and crop domestication. Yeah. Where did corn come from? Maize. Yeah. Basically. I mean, it's only known in the new world, but, Mustn't it have been on the ark if everything was on the ark? 
basically we, we must have sprinted from the Ark to, to the we sprinted from the Ark in, in the Middle East all the way over to Alaska land. We we sprinted. <laughs> and then everybody lost track of it. So there's no rice in the in the new world. There's no potato or no uh, uh, cattle. There's no wheat. But there are potatoes, which are unknown in the old world. There's uh, there is uh, maize and all of these other fruit crops, tomatoes and, and all these other things and that are unknown <laughs> and chocolate and all the rest. And somehow or other, they get segregated. How? But what, what did the kids divvy up the stuff? And no one has any references to sh chocolate. In in the Bible, so well, I, I, I guess the, I guess the certain language I guess that when the languages happen, like okay, the, these certain languages took the chocolate, these certain language, this language group took the the, the corn. Yeah, <laughs> which brings up also that Tower of Babel story. That's another problem uh, that uh, gets into a difficulty. It just and and yeah. and all of that's without even the heat problem, because that's that's the, 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 trying to compress. Just as when you rub your hands together real hard, you start getting them warmer, that things that are sped up too fast generate heat. And if all of that heat tries to take place in too short of a time, it like melts the earth. <laughs> I think of Tower of Babel, I thought I realized this to thought about this today. The tower, the tower is so called it wasn't that far from the, fl the actual flood. So how many people even were around and built that tower anyways? Because there were, if people, if people still lived a, a long time before they even had kids, like hundreds of years before that time. They, they, they're they they're facing a bottleneck because although theoretically you can have uh, Noah and the kids breeding like rabbits at an exponential rate to produce the current population things, you can do that mathematically. It doesn't make sense dynamically, but they can pretend. But then their rates are such that if you think about how many people there were right after the flood and like for the first 500 or a thousand years, there aren't enough to be able to do much of anything. So who the hell built the pyramids and all that other Egyptian stuff? They were, they're trying they to squeeze really, too really much good. together. They were, they were excellent. Build, like they were strong, excellent builders. Yeah. Lifted, yeah. Lifted builders. And so it's one, uh, the reason why this hasn't come up much in creationist apologetics is because none of them are Egyptologists. And so they literally didn't think about it, but I've been waiting like a ticking time bomb for this to start being a problem. And it's starting to happen now as a small number, I think this guy Dons or something like that, and a, a, a small group uh, answers in Genesis that are trying to argue. Basically, they stick rollers underneath the entire Egyptian culture and roll it all down post flood because there's, they have to. But that just doesn't, won't make sense. It, it's never going to work. <laughs> but hey, this is this is great. So for hey, we, we've almost been two hour two hours, and and you have and you have not cut off at all. So <laughs> yes, that's. A, I think it's because there's just the two of us. Uh, Streamyard gets more of a problem the more people there are. And so ones where like when there's five or six people and too many little boxes in there, so it's like uh, the um, uh, the Brady Bunch. Uh, uh, opening, uh, then that's when it's most likely that I start getting the little spinning circles and get knocked out. So, I think last, <laughs> time, last time we had only two or three, like we had only like three people and you, you count a little bit. But now, they, they still, oh, still small, but yeah, you, you're lasting a lot longer. The gods like therapsids, Lamont. That's why I've been able to talk. They adore therapsids. They really wanted to make sure that Robert Broom's prediction was perfectly done. And not only, not only Robert Broom, that there's issues about the cartilage that forms between one bone and another, and that, that gradually you've got to disconnect those systems so that the little bones can move up into the ear. And we've got the transitional forms for those stages too. It's just yeah. an amazing amount of material. If God did not want me to believe in therapsids, he shouldn't have created all of that. That was a blunder. Yeah. Back to synaptic, oh, back to our original topic, synaptic, when did we, when did we get our, start getting our, like we call it our, our milk teeth, milk teeth. Oh, those are quite a ways down the road. I think that would be um, uh, um, probably post-KT, that um, uh, a lot of that has to do with the particular dentition pattern of uh, the more modern mammals. In fact, um, you could argue that if you were to be looking at any of the mammals that would have been around at the time when there were the earliest mammals, 
you would be hard pressed to say, well, now that one's going to go off in a direction that's going to have the little milk teeth there in the primates. And that one's going to go off in this direction with that. You wouldn't be able to anticipate that. And yet, Increment by increment by increment, it gets there. But yeah, in terms of exactly when that popped up in the thing, that's one that you got me on, Lamont. Okay, so cause I, I know, I know, because I, I know. Uh, see, the the monitoring part. This, I think they lick. They they're, they're more liquors than they are of the milk than they are suckers. Oh, and they and they and there's a reason for that as well. Platypuses, and I described that in Slam Dunk. Uh, that the platypus, the, the wiring, they've developed a sensory thing in that little bill. It's not like a duck bill at all. It's like a leathery flap. It's like a piece of skin. It's not the same structure. It just resembles vaguely like a duck. But the point is, it's a sensory thing. And they live in very murky environment. And they are able to sense their potential prey uh, uh, by... Um, um, uh, what the electrosensing sensing is. Well, that wiring that comes up from the bill has to go right through where the roots of the teeth are. And it turns out that you don't have space there for more than just the one. You either got the wiring or you got the teeth roots. Yeah. So it's basically crowded out all of those. And the early monotremes, the early platypuses have teeth, but gradually that disappears and you end up with that all specialized toothless model that we have now because they're wholly specialized for that uh, electrosensing. Yeah, but by the time we got to yeah, the time we got to the placentals and the and the marsupials, we we, we started su sucking. Oh, we're but that the, oh, by the way, yes, that whole bit of the milk teeth thing is the notion about the replacement teeth, and a lot of organisms do that. You get you get um, uh, virtually every vertebrate is replacing teeth in one form or another, and the issue is whether or not like the the mammals and our group have specialized in having an initial set of teeth, which are then abandoned and the new ones grow up above it or push the other ones out and, and fill in. Well, that same process occurs in, in dinosaurs even. Often a conveyor belt where there's a new tooth that's starting to come up and eventually it pushes the other one out, but they're growing teeth continuously. What's kind of gotten boring for us is we produce an initial set and then one replacement set. Yeah, that's what I was talking about earlier, how I think I've like at least the mammal sides, we have only have two. We only have one backup, and other other vertebrates like sharks and stuff. And I'll, you know, have, have a little bit more backups. Yeah, I, as I, if memory serves me on it, that that there's enough variation in the history of mammals that that didn't all happen all at once. That you had variations as to tooth eruption patterns and replacement patterns, and it can vary from one species to another. And there, there is a you price you pay about being able to generate fresh teeth because that takes energy. And there's also genetic switches that may have just gotten arbitrarily shut off and to where, you know, the animal only lives a couple years. Uh, um, you know, why bother with another set of teeth? It's never going to get to. Well, you mean it all, it all happened in one generation? <laughs> yes, yeah, all happened at once. All, all after the arc, all the little animals scampered off of the ark and then then rapidly proliferated and then many of them dropped dead. There's the they, story. They, the bred, they bred, for a while they bred like bunnies and guppies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or or the or the platypus or the the koalas that are hurled by volcanic eruption to Australia. That's another one of the hypotheses no, no, that was presented. No, they didn't do that. They the two kangaroos put every, put all the all the animals in their pouches, like all the males in the one pouch, all the females in the one pouch. And they and they hop. And in and fact, the whole hop. the whole bunch, because of the of the specialized nature of the Australian fauna, they all went on a on a, a tour junket to make sure they all yeah. stayed together. And they're and they're, and, and they're like, hey, why don't we take the monotremes too with, with us? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Th that's the one area that. Although there is a fossil record for the monotremes, uh, we can't say that we have a really clear picture of just how diverse they might have been. They would have been relatively small critters, and uh, uh, relatively small critters are hard to preserve. So most of the things that we have, most mammal species in the fossil record are known by just teeth. Yeah. And I also, apparently, a live birth happens in other, other vertebrates, too. Oh yeah, and in and in a quite a different range. Uh, uh, even I think there are some live bearing sharks and um, uh, live bearing um, uh, reptiles, and that it pops up. Um, and even the dynamics that lead to the placenta 
have genetic substrates that are showing up in other kinds of organisms in different contexts. Again, we alluded to a lot of that in both the, of the of the books because all of the boundary layers that you try to do to arbitrarily pigeonhole things, which is what baromenology would have to do for creationists, um, really starts falling apart if you look too closely because you still, you just find almost this is and nearly that's and because the genes are doing all sorts of things in various lineages and it's just can't be reduced to the tidy little cartoon version that you get in the anti-evolution literature. Yeah, I heard the placental might have been from a, a e ERV. Yes, yes. It, well, it, it definitely plays a role. And that's the other issue about all these little cute retro transposons popping around. We know that occurred in another area is that the uh, ALU a retro transposon, which is like 10% of us, 1.4 million of them and proliferating. Most of them don't do a damn thing. Some of them are dangerous if they kick in. There's a bunch of diseases that are triggered by ALUs uh, um, becoming active inside of a protein when they shouldn't. But somewhere along the line in the primate lineage, there's some ALUs that got stuck in the brain systems and they've been useful. So there's a whole network of things that make use of ALU in uh, primate brain physiology and is human that brain one that, physiology. Is that the one that makes us have to eat oranges for vitamin C and stuff? Uh, no, I, uh, that's a different one from the from the, uh, um, the 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 shutting down of the whatever the GULO gene or something. That's uh, that pro normally processes vitamin C. We do have an I hate broccoli gene. Uh, <laughs> it's I can never remember the name of the damn thing, but it's uh, the bitter taste receptor. And oh. in primates, when you eat rotten fruit, you go bleh. Unless and it's this will also occur if you eat like broccoli and green vegetables. Well, oh, in about that half of the human species, that's been disabled. Yeah. And so those who have that mutant gene can munch on green veggies all the time, no problem. Yeah, and you can predict with great accuracy how how many alleles they have as to whether they like broccoli as a kid, uh, but or and and as an adult versus not liking it as a kid but liking it as an adult. And they can predict what kind of alleles you have just on that basis. I'm yeah, a broccoli. I, I, I was the broccoli. I, I was in the broccoli's fine as long as it's covered in cheese. Gene. Yeah, but normally that when you have a, a President George Bush number one uh, couldn't stand broccoli and he's not making it up. I'm sure he has the normal receptor, which gives a bitter taste if you try to eat green fruit. Uh, there's another thing that uh, um, a, about a quarter to a half of Europeans have an allele that if you eat beans, you could drop dead. They have a terrible allergic reaction to them. And that's and why Plato the saying, don't eat beans. Well, that's because some people have a problem. Same thing with people who can't have shellfish or people who are uh, allergic to uh, peanuts and the like. And, and, and mel the, the, mel the milk allergic. Yeah. Lactose intolerant. Yeah, it's all, uh, it, it, there's no malicious gods involved. It's just mutations, you know, and you figure out what they are and you work your way around them and develop technologies to assist you. Yeah, apparently, and, and, as a kid, I as a baby kid, I I hated I hated peas, and I still hate peas now. I'm not a great pea person, although if they're fresh peas under the right circumstances, but most of them are kind of little squishy things uh, yeah. that I can do without beans. If, I'm not I can... terribly fond of, but in fresh and cooked in the right kind of olive oil and the like, uh, I've had a, a, a recipe of that done at a restaurant in S Seattle some years back. That was like heaven on earth. It was the most amazingly good thing. But you know that that if it's done that way, wow. But yeah. other than that, I can. I take think I think now I can kind of eat peas if they're if I don't if I don't if, I don't, if, if they're like small if they're covered up if they're like uh, one if they're like surrounded by other stuff and two I don't actually bite into them like to swallow them whole. My rule on on um. Um, I think Jer uh, Jeffrey Pollan or whatever his name is that, that said the rules of thing is eat what you like, um, eat more plants, uh, like don't eat anything to extinction. That pretty much covers it. You said, we said, we said, did that, er we said that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait. For anyway, wait for I hope that. we didn't bore everybody for the last two hours. No. Uh, well, like, thanks for being on here again. Uh, could you like PM me your email, your sources I can put in the description? 
Oh, uh, yes, I can put in. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, on Twitter. I'll give you the uh, the linkages for uh, the direct ones for the books and the website, and that'll cover everything. Well, yeah, I, I, I'll even I, throw I in parallel to Phileas Fogg. If you like fiction, yeah. You know, if you like Jules Verne, you should buy the fiction book too. Yeah, I just I just I try to start doing that more, having having sources in my description. And uh, anything I I restrict myself to anything that I can get full text. So I don't worry about putting in the stuff for just the abstracts. But if okay. I can get access to the full PDF of the paper or the full HTML, uh, then I put that in because that means that they can read the whole thing. Okay. And any of those kind of sources, it, it just is a springboard because if you're listening to somebody and go, oh, I'm interested in that. What about that? Well, you know, we stick it in there and, and people can deal with it. So I do that in the show. I've, I've, now that I've figured out how to access my correct channel on my laptop version of the videos for Evolution Hour, I'm going to kind of do um, a retread of the two episodes that got shunted onto the wrong one and uh, for the next couple of weeks. And then I'll pick up where I left off and, uh, and resume uh, the world that way. <laughs> yeah, so check out... Uh, the, 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 check out his channel the, tomorrow night about... about well, 24 hours from now, you'll be doing you know, Evolution Hour series again. Yeah, yeah. And, and so what? Are, now that we've killed off synapses, what are you going to be dealing with next? For, depends, on, depends on whatever guests I get next, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> topic, whatever, to, topic whatever they want to talk about. Yeah. Remember, everybody, that there are ancestors. This little cute little guy is one of our closer relatives. We're more closely related to this than we are to any dinosaur or bird. Oh, before we go, do we know if that shell, that cell was was for more for visual purposes like sexual selection or? Oh, good question. I think because sales pop up several times in a lot of different organisms, it's probably a bit of both that there's probably a thermal regulatory element to it and sexual display because whatever you end up with ends up a sexual display in organisms that pay attention to that. And so uh, not everybody will do that. Uh, some of the, the, the features are so over the top that you wonder why. And the same way I have this, I can't prove this, but my pet theory about Tyrannosaur arms, first of all, they're really well muscled they're like bodybuilder arms. They're not flimsy. And yet they're really ridiculously short. I think they may have been sexual displays. Oh, cool. I can imagine the ones, you know, kind of flexing. Oh, baby. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, get me going. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's my that's my pet hypothesis. Yeah, I saw a thing about, about kind of some kind of fist or guppy things where the, 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 the thing kind of experiment, I think, I, where I read it at, but it's like, the gu the guppies or whatever that had no predators in that in that little pond or stream were more colorful and stuff. But the ones that had predators were more camouflage. More camouflage. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the, the how that's the other factor of how you have to think about everything in an ecological context, is that it's not merely what you look like, but how others perceive you. Even down to what things look like. Um, it, when we discovered that birds could see in the ultraviolet. It turned out that there were a lot of bird species that seem rather bland when you look at their plumage until you look at them in ultraviolet. And there are spots on their plumage that look the same color as what's next door, except they're really bright in ultraviolet that the bird sees and you don't. Yeah, it's, it's, hard, sometimes it's hard to find that balance between natural selection and sexual selection, where you got to survive, you also got to look good for your, your mate. <laughs> You got it. You got it. You got to get turned on and result in boinking. And and my my favorite in the weird department of the lesbian fish that uh, that have no males at all, but they require a male to get them ovulating, and and but they self fertilize. And so they've gone and they played teases with the neighboring species of males that are closely related to them getting themselves excited and the poor males get nothing whatsoever out of it because they're not actually procreating with the, with the lesbian fish. <laughs> yeah, one more thing before we go, your opinion on this. Uh, you know, we have, we have a virus going around right now, right? Hmm? We have a virus going around right now. 
Oh yes, yes, heard, and, a, and a dangerous one. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, I I've heard all this stuff about we should let the, it run its course and and have heard of me like we should let, let the virus go and stuff and let the, you know get our bodies and stuff and not not to worry about vaccines and stuff like well like well, yeah we did that before and the plague <laughs> called the plague yeah it yeah the, uh, that, and it, it's looking like herd immunity isn't very herdish it all depends as well about whether or not the virus uh once you get an immunity to it it's immune it's looking like that may not be the case that it's going to be like a recurring virus uh, uh, the general rule should be politicians who can't pay attention to the science and are scientifically illiterates should not be listened to and preferably should be voted out of office. Hint, hint. I've, I've, I voted. I did the early voting today. Yeah, I dropped mine off at the um, drop box. Uh, we've been voting for mail in Washington State for years. Uh, and so uh, uh, it was easy peasy on that. I slept up through the snow and uh, stuck it in the little drop box next to the library, and that was all done. And then I'll be checking later to see that it's been received because there's websites, so we can find out whether or not the vote's been counted and all that. Uh, this seems just reasonable to do. You know, we really needed to. And, and all, one thing, all of the, the reactions that we've been doing to the virus are not things that we need to forget because these things are going to happen again that there are many, many viruses knocking around in there that can jump into the human environment at a, a moment's notice the, with yeah. international travel and all that the way we do. Uh, and it's yeah. nothing paranoia about, oh, the China virus. Ooh, boogie, boogie, yeah. boogie. Uh, these things can pop up from any place in the world. Yeah. And so the procedures that we do for being careful and instituting uh, masks and social distancing and other operations are ones that are and zooming instead of uh, uh, live uh, operations. These things are things that we won't be uh, not using in the future. These things are skill yeah. sets that we should retain. Yeah, we, we and we don't know. Right, we still don't know right now if COVID's more like uh, like the a measles or measles or polio virus, where. You, if we get a vaccine, is it's like pretty much one and done, or if it's like the flu, you, you get an update every so often. Yeah, and we don't know enough about it yet. We also don't know how it's it's going to be interacting as we get into the flu season. Whether people that might be okay if they just get COVID, but if they get COVID and the flu simultaneously, whether or not that impact will be different. Um, the one yeah. upside is that it doesn't affect kids as seriously as older people, which was the opposite of the 1918 flu. It was dropping dead young people more so than older ones. Yeah, I got my flu shots as soon as I can because I, I, I have, I have asthma, so I don't want to take any chances. Yeah, I yeah, I said, and and there are there are even people who have gotten over COVID are not necessarily now happy as clams again because there are apparently effects on the lungs, respiratory system, and that, that uh, can be lingering. So um, it's it, the, the cavalier attitude the president has been taking on this is absolutely disgusting. Yeah. Plain yeah, as that. Yeah. I saw some, so it says, they, they, <laughs> I don't usually get I I don't try to get too political on this on this channel if I can, but it's funny. I read this thing where, like, somebody was saying, "How come it's all the, all the Republicans and stuff getting the virus, not the Democrats?" I'm like, "Well, maybe because we're following the rules and, and they're really it's, careful." It's, yeah, there's been a few people in the Harris campaign that had some um, issues and they had to social distance and that you know it, it, it's a virus it gets around, but you can see by the the way people are behaving. You know, the, these uh, it, it, when people do really stupid things in public, politics steps into the public realm because it, it, no one should feel ashamed about this. Mr. Trump is my employee. If you're a taxpayer, he's your employee. You're a voter. So he's your our employee. We have a right to be able to ask, excuse me, but are you doing stupid? Don't do that. <laughs> Because, you know, it's not the other way around. He's not a king. He's not an emperor. He, he's our employee, and I'd like him to act like it. Uh, well, thanks for being on again. Uh, check, yeah. check out the show tomorrow. Links will be in the description below once I get them. As I always say at the end of my show, never stop learning and enjoy the randomness. I'll see you next time. Bye.